to councillors who we are expecting to join us. So um, we we may increase in size, but I don't think we'll reach. Um, sadly, I don't think we'll be core at this morning. We've had a number of apologies due to um, various illnesses and sicknesses. So thank you all for making your way in this morning. I know it's been a bit challenging and a bit on the cold side. So uh, thank you for coming. Um, we'll start with uh, apologies for absence um, and then introduce the meeting. So, yes, Chair. Apologies received from Councillor Axar, Councillor Burrow, Councillor Chalk, Councillor Fenton, Councillor Lumby and Councillor Sutherland. Thank you for that. And do I have any declarations of interest as outlined on the agenda? No, not seeing those from anybody. So uh, just to remind people that this is the budget mayoral Q&A, uh, the second mayoral Q&A of this municipal year, and uh, we will be recorded and it will go out on YouTube later. So if I can remind people to use their microphones, please, for, for clarity. Um, and we joined this morning by Laura Schoaf, uh, Chief Exec, Bob Slay, Portfolio Holder for Finance, uh, Andy Street, the Mayor, Linda Horn, Lead for Finance, and Kate Davies. So thank you all for your attendance this morning. Uh, so at that, I will hand over to uh, the Mayor for his opening statement. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Uh, so sorry we've got a few gaps this morning because I was looking forward to a good rounded meeting but never mind I'm sure those who are here will make up for the absentees so just a few words uh, from me by way of introduction so I think the fairest thing to say about the papers you've got in front of you are there's some very positive things in it there are some and there are some very challenging things in them and I think I will hopefully honestly lay out both of those by way of introduction so positives first in the time honored way and um, we never really spend any time on this because it's gone well but the truth is we've had five years now where the CA has landed its outcome every year pretty much on budget and we've lived within our means so that has been good and this year I know I shouldn't count chickens Linda but this year looks as though we're headed in a similar place in terms of the budget being a little bit more generous than the final outcome so that's good and if obviously there's any questions about uh, this uh, year very pleased to take them. I think the other encouraging thing is that a lot of work has gone into presenting a balanced budget for next year. Uh, we have the Met leaders and uh, to discussion tomorrow, which is the sort of first stage before we then go formally through the budget setting process, which uh, Bob Slade will guide the board through in January and February. But I'm expecting that there will be support for proposing that balanced budget for next year. It's been difficult to get to that. Uh, but there have been a fairly a number of fairly good conversations in July and September with Met leaders, which then are reflected in the budget papers. So that's encouraging. Uh, the but piece, though, is that we've not got to a sustainable position. And obviously we will talk about that in just a moment. The other very positive thing that I think should just be reflected upon is that steadily the CA has brought in a large amount of capital to the region. And there's one of the slides that Linda has prepared for you, which shows that I think we're at about £4.9 billion now of total input, particularly in the transport area. Uh, so that looks a really promising, uh, really successful story over time. Lots more discussions. I know we're going to focus on the Trailblazer devolution deal. We're hoping that will bring in more, but it has to be said that is already there. The buts in the story or the negative bits in the story, I think there are three points to pull out there as well. The first is obviously some areas, the revenue budgets are lower than we would wish. No bones about it. Yes, we've lived within our means, but that has meant that we've had to cut that block appropriately. And we, there are lots of questions this morning about what else we would like to do, but we are cannot because of that budget constraint. Uh, the really big negative point, though, of course, is that the forward look shows a substantial gap in the medium term financial plan. That's no news. It was like that last year. And the real driving force there are some of the dynamics in the transport budget, which I'm sure we will talk about. We're not on our own in that transport position. The dynamics that are going on across the country. 
You hear of TfL in potential existential positions. You hear of other authorities seeking government support. So there are dynamics in the transport provision that are really very serious after COVID, and we should spend some time on that. And then, though, um, the underlying point is, of course, that we've got to bring in new income to address that shortfall, that projected deficit. And the new income line, we've got some choices, and I suspect we will discuss these this morning. Obviously, we could go back to the precept. A decision was taken in 2018 not to do it. Leaders have wanted to stick to that, but it is there as an option. Uh, the second option, of course, is the transport levy. Given the big deficit is in transport, there's an obvious synergy. Should we be moving that further forward? You've got a graph that shows the reduction in transport levy over the last five, six years. And we've just moved by 2% last year and 2% this year in terms of the budget. So there's a question there. But really, uh, given the, those two things, neither of them are attractive because ultimately they go back either to our local authorities or to our constituents themselves. We then come to we have to try to find another source of additional funding and that takes us straight to the devolution deal where the discussions are ongoing at the moment. And I know there's questions on this, so I won't say it all in the in the introductions where I am optimistic that we will secure some further capital sums. And I'm also optimistic that it has not yet been confirmed by the Treasury that there may be an opportunity for some early stages of fiscal devolution, which would give us some more revenue spending power as well. And that is a very, very live debate right at the moment. So that's all I wanted to say, Cathy, by way of intro. Thanks very much for that. And just to remind um, members, you have all received the, the aid memoir from Lindsay. It is literally just that. It is just to help the flow of the meeting. If you've got any other additional questions that you want to pose as we go through, please feel free to indicate. So I'll open it up um, for, for questions. I, I, I do have some questions on the financial challenges and sustainability of the budget, but if other, any other members would like to come in first, um, more than happy to take those questions. OK, so <laughs> right. Sorry about that then. Um, OK, so I mean, we understand that you, you haven't set a precept for your mayoralty term and that you've made a commitment that you wouldn't be setting a precept for the remainder of this mayoralty. Um, but do you think that the decision made not to set a, a, a precept has had an impact on the stability of the budget? Um, Straight question, straight answer. Yes. Um, so the decision was taken in 2018. Uh, you will know that the proposal was put by myself, seconded by Councillor Slade, that we would have a precept and the numbers are in the pack as to the difference that it would have made. The fact that was not supported, and I'll be very clear about it, it was a down on party lines decision, uh, has given us less room for manoeuvre than we would otherwise have had. The scale of it, the proposal in 2018 was for 7.8 million. If that had gone up, it would be a small increase with inflation, obviously. Um, that would have been in there to help close the gap. Uh, but the decision was taken for understandable reasons, and I've respected those. And actually, as the time has gone on since 2018, it's actually become more, those reasons have become more acute, not less. So the leaders, and I actually agree with this myself, and hence why we're given a commitment for the duration of this mayoral term, um, uh, 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 to introduce it in the height of the cost of living crisis would have been extremely uh, poor. Uh, but my own regret is it wasn't done in 2018 when I think the conditions would actually have allowed it. Thank you. If I can just um, move that on to a, to a little bit of a discussion around the trailblazer devolution deal. So yeah. we're seeking powers, fiscal powers from uh, government to allow us to do things differently and to ha have one pot funding arrangements. Given the fact that we haven't used the precept powers to raise that money, do you think that will negatively impact at all on discussions with government? Um, yeah, quite simply, would they view that we haven't ch we've chosen not to use the fiscal powers we've got? Um, so is there any question over them devolving additional fiscal powers to us? So this is a very good, this is a very good question. Um, so our negotiating position at the moment is all around uh, new 
Now, let me just explain what's in the new because you described it as single pods. So I think I just need to spend a bit of time breaking down the different elements of this. So what we've asked for, first of all, is that we move to single pods, as you say. So that would mean one housing settlement, one transport settlement, one settlement with bays over things like retrofitting, rather than, and other mayors around the country totally agree with this, us constantly bidding for small sums of money and actually wasting a lot of time. So that is about a more mature relationship of how we get the money but you might say that's money we already get. It's not necessarily guaranteed to be new money, but it's definitely more efficient. You can plan for it. Now, so that's one element. That's what you referred to in single pot. The second element is some of the elements of the original devolution deal. So, for example, how much gain share money we get, and it's described in your pack as 36 million a year, and we use have used that for our investment plan. When you now look at what's been negotiated in other areas who've had later deals, our 36 million for the size of the population here looks to be light. So we're trying to reopen some of the negotiations that happened previously. So that's the sort of second part of the Trailblazer deal. And then the third part of the deal is where we'd be looking for new fiscal powers. And that's really where we'd be saying some of the cash that is raised by government in taxation in the region and is passed straight to London. And then we apply to effectively have it back through some of our investments that we would retain that tax raised in the region. That, I think, is the most ambitious of the three asks, and it might take longer. But those are the three uh, revenue asks that we've got and then also we've got capital asks so to give you a really good example of that um the uh housing funds which we've done extremely well in getting cash out of government we're looking for new housing funds and we've asked for 400 million for affordable homes and we've asked for 350 million for regeneration it'll never be the sums that you asked for but i am optimistic that we will get those so sorry to go through at length but there are four different types of things in that conversation. Now, in terms of your question of us not using the power that we already had, I don't think it will make much difference to the capital piece, and I don't think it will make much difference to the single pot conversation. Where it will potentially come into play from government is over the additional tax revenue piece. And again, just to be absolutely clear, because this is worth explaining, there were three tax sources of taxation that they offered us in the first deal, not just one. The first was the precept. The second was having a supplementary business rate, which again, we chose not to do because um, uh, it just uh, was never going uh, to uh, be acceptable to those paying business rates, given the, given the difficulty for businesses. And the third, of course, is the retention of business rates which we have had up to a point. So uh, to sum it all up, we've got four different asks. The precept question could come in with two of them, but we have not at this stage put it in any way on the negotiating table. Thank you for that. And I think that's a, a, a well-rounded and comprehensive answer that kind of helps our understanding around that. Because I think I was particularly concerned that there may be a negative view from government if you're not using the powers you've got one we give you more and please i i acknowledge that could be the case so it's a very fair call out but i think we have to say to government uh, look we took this decision for sound reasons given the economic pressures on those paying taxation thanks for that do i have any other questions jamie that's the tenant oh yeah um you talked about um the the challenges within the transport but the income yeah. the transport budget obviously given the pandemic and all of that has had significant impact we've seen other mayors um have secured financial support packages from the government around transport particularly uh london being the, the prime example have there been any discussions doing that for the west midlands or is it just kind of a non-starter um, fascinating, Jamie. This shows the ability of London to create good headlines. Uh, so um, the answer is all areas of the country have had huge support from government for transport. 
Uh, Linda will give us all the numbers off the top of her head. But um, since the onset of the pandemic, we had um, two, two primary sources. The first was called the Bus Recovery Grant, where they have basically made good the gap in the uh, difference between revenue expected and revenue achieved uh, by our bus operators, and they've completely filled that. And the commitment on that is get this right, Linda, up until April, I think, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, so we have had that, so has everybody else. And then similarly for the light rail system, uh, we have had exactly the same approach called light rail recovery grant. And it's why, frankly, for the current last three years, including this year, all pandemic affected years, we have been able to basically continue with the budgets as were, and why there is potentially a much bigger risk in the future if that type of funding does not continue. And of course, also, and to be fair to say, our rail network, although it never appears in our budgets because it's not our provision, the government have, of course, completely made good the deficit there. So we've all had that across the country. What TfL had on top of, despite all of that, they got themselves into position. And I will use this language because Sadiq Khan has used this language. The TfL were going bust, and so they had to have a separate bailout. But we have every other area has had the same three forms of transport support. That's the thing. Thank you. Uh, and in my question, you were talking about the fourth option for the government to have more yeah. physical powers to have a tax which are generated here, stayed locally. I just want to know what your thoughts are on, say, redistribution, because if, if we come to the combined authority, the redistribution, do you think you, you have an idea of where the taxes are collected, they have to be spent exactly there, or because some of our regions are very deprived? And for the, I just want to know what your thoughts are on redistribution, so because some of the areas don't have that much prosperity, but the needs yeah. are uh, compared with this. Uh, good question. Um, really, to be really clear, uh, if we were to retain taxes locally, um, there's a very interesting uh, schedule in the pack which shows if it was the precept, which authorities would be paying what. And it is a fact that the more affluent authorities would be paying more if you the, um, uh, the precept, uh, the most extremely affected authority is Solihull, it's very clear. So there would naturally be a redistribution because to be really clear and answer your question, we would not be saying that if 20% of the precept came from Solihull, 20% of the expenditure has got to be in Solihull, it would be into a total pot. So inevitably there would be some redistributive effect. Uh, it wouldn't be, if we're talking about something like air passenger duty, vehicle excise duty, it won't be as extreme a portion of where it comes from as the worked example, which is around a property tax, but it would still mean those spending more in the more affluent boroughs would be paying more. So again, there would be a naturally redistributive effect. Thank you. Do you have any other questions um, around transport as we've kind of started to talk about transport? Uh, Councillor McCarthy, I think you wanted to pick something up on that. How does this budget support investment in longer term transport strategy that's aimed to improve either connectivity for many of our residents and to reduce the journey times? Um, great question, Martin. Um, substantially is the one word answer. So um, one of the problems with this budget and um, uh, is that it doesn't, in a sense, look at the total expenditure being made in the West Midlands in capital investment, because it only looks at what's, uh, and just let me try to explain, you're looking slightly mystified, so let me explain what I mean. It only looks at that that, that is directly in the WMCA, uh, or paid for by the WMCA. So, for example, there are a lot of other transport investments that are not uh, literally owned by the WMCA. So I'll give you two good examples of that. Our rail corridor investment programmes, whether it be at Warsaw, Wolverhampton or Camp Hill, they are not included in this because it's a direct funding. If you look at all the work that's been going on, including the bus fleet in Coventry, that is not included. So in a sense, Martin, you have to see beyond this uh, budget to see the total capital investment in transport. 
But if you then look at that, and we could easily supply you that chair if you would like to see that lens. If you look at that, you will see that uh, there is, uh, I think, this next year, a total of £700 million pounds of projects going on, transport improvements, which are all about cleaning, speeding up and connecting the communities that are not there, uh, not connected at the moment. So I'm fair in assuming it's similar to the uh, drop in session that I went to on Tuesday this week at, on my own council. We we're talking about transport strategy and being ready to sort of use monies as they become available. Yes. Uh, I don't know what you went to in Solihull, but I, my presumption and Bob might like to comment actually. Were you at both? No, I didn't. You, you, well, you weren't there either. But uh, so using monies as they become available, most definitely. So. We've we've obviously won some of these specific capital investments for transport, which are outside this budget. But and the single biggest element, of course, is the city region sustainable transport settlement, where we've got our whole programme of investments that occur over the next five years. But I mean, I am more than happy to assemble the total transport capital budget for you to see, because I do understand it's difficult because it comes from different sources, and it's that then that is trying to. Uh, deliver our overall strategic transport plan, which of course is a statutory government document. Councillor Lal? Uh, thank you, Councillor Lal. Uh, just to say, uh, I know we're go going through a very difficult time at the moment, uh, but on the other hand, we want to encourage sustainable travel, walking and cycling, and the bus travel is the most popular mode of travel. We want to call you more people, but that we have been decreasing over the years, despite our best efforts. Is there any way we can aim for, uh, say, subsidized travel for every um, person on low income or or, uh, or unemployed person? You would encourage them to take the habit of either same travel or the bus travel. Yeah. Okay, so thank even you. Even free travel. Uh, yeah. <laughs> okay, great question. Now, um, Let's just deal with the general point of this, the sort of what you might call the sort of overall approach to it, then the detailed maths of the budget. And of course, the general approach is all the positive stuff. Then we get to the hard bit with the budget. So we are trying across the CA, and this is absolutely agreed as policy, to encourage public transport use by doing three things. Investing in new capability and making sure that the existing capability that we've got is obviously at the very best standard. And the second point, obviously, is around fares. And that's why trying to make it cheaper, a whole deal with National Express to reduce our fares, lowest in the country, back to 2013 space, is probably the single most important thing we can do to drive it. And then, of course, investing in, um, investing in clean uh, uh, tech as well, because people actually, there's very clear evidence that if the rolling stock, whether it be trains, buses, trams, is good and clean and reliable, people will use it more. And that's why there's so much capital going into that. And of course, the other thing that you do is you improve the routes. So that's why we've spent so much money on bus priorities coming in on the Walsall Road, the Coventry Road, Low Lane, because that also, if you speed the journey, people will do it. So it's got to be reliable, cheap and quick, basically. And that's what we're doing to make all of that work. So that's the overall picture. Now, if you come then to, can we provide, uh, reduce, can we provide free travel or any other concessions, you come right up against the budget that we're looking at today. And there's a detailed paper in here about the transport budget, and it shows the cost of the concessions that we offer, which Linda will correct me off the top of my head, I think it's about £42 million. Pounds. Now, if we want to offer any other concession, and let's take it to its extreme, free travel for everyone under 16, you can do it if we push that budget up and all of our local authorities, so ultimately our taxpayers, pay for it. At the moment, the agreement amongst all the leaders is we've got this about right, so we're not pushing for more concessions. We're trying to defend what we do, free travel for all, pensioners, half price travel for apprentices and trainees, and we're therefore being really blunt about it. The budget is not looking to extend the concessions further. It's one last point. There is a review of those concessions being undertaken. Uh, policy has been agreed again by the leaders. My own view, and I'm, I know the leader of your council, uh, shares the view that we cannot step back from the main concessions because they're so important to people, particularly at this cost of living time. Hopefully that answers, Billy. If I can, if 
I can just add if there's a direct, direct link with the concessionary fare schemes and obviously the transport levy. Transport levy has in essence been flat cash for quite some years. But I think that the leaders have taken the clear decision this year within the proposed budget to actually increase the transport levy by a figure of 2%. Now, all that that does in essence, as the mayor quite rightly says, it maintains the level of concessionary fares that we currently have within the system. But I don't think there's a great deal of room to increase that at this point in time, unless we have an ongoing commitment to increasing the levy year on year. I think that's really the challenge, the challenge, the, the challenge that we face. Notwithstanding that, I think it's worth making the point that pre-COVID patronage on public transport was going up. Um, year on year, uh, both on metro and on bus. Um, clearly, uh, the issues around COVID have meant people are uh, more reluctant to use public transport, but, but certainly we're doing all we can to try and encourage that, not least through our relationship with NX and the improvement in some of the bus systems, the platinum buses, for instance, that have come in, you know, the, the zebra system that's going into Coventry for all electric buses and then obviously hydrogen and equally sprint which we're investing in very heavily in, in the in the current period just one one wider point because the mayor made it we only have control over certain levels of direct funding to the combined authority but it shouldn't be lost on us that there's a lot of other funding coming in through the uh, road road schemes and such like the so very substantial sums to increase some of those uh, uh, corridors as well. So um, I think we, we're doing what we can, but quite clearly it's a bigger picture than just what the combined authority itself can undertake. Yes. Uh, if, if I may come back. Thank you. Um, you know, I understand the, the budget exchange, but with all the best efforts, the open is still not where it should, should be. So the, the patterns of, of, of our public talk use is not where we want it to be. Right. And that has been saying from past 40 odd years. So we are not making that progress to, uh, at the speed we wanted to. So I thought that's why we, it would be in, the, in our interest and the public interest and the paid interest at the moment. They're putting on some other services because they can't, because they're not viable. But if you can have a partnership, raise a way, you yeah. do everything together to, yeah. it's in every interest to get the better. It, it, it's really interesting what you say, but let's just examine the facts here. As the Deputy Mayor just said, pre-COVID, public transport patronage on all parts of our public transport train massively, a tram massively, us slightly, was increasing. And actually the increase helps the operators earn more money, so we've got less gaps in our funding. COVID, of course, knocked it all for six. And we've, as Jamie's question drew out, we've had to rely on government subsidy uh, for the public transport network to hold it. The patronage numbers now, you'll be interested. Tram is back over 100% when it runs. Uh, the uh, rail is running, again, when they're not on strike, at about 75%. And bus is running about 85 And one of the reasons that, the, and actually compared to other parts of the country, that's pretty good. And one of the, and the, the sort of the reason that we've got this big potential risk in our budget going forward is that shortage of patronage. So you are right. It's not just good for society. It will solve our financial problem if we get the patronage back up. So what are we trying to do about that? Because it almost goes full circle. We're trying to maintain the frequency of the service, invest in the quality of it and make it affordable. And what this budget is really trying to do is enable us to keep doing all those things to get the patronage back up. And I, for one, am not going to sort of flinch away from keeping spending money on trying to invest in public transport and get it back up. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Waters next. Right. Morning, Andy. Good morning. Uh, you've already touched on this. I understand there are subsidies for certain bus routes these subsidies, are these subsidies going to be put forward for, for areas which don't have or any other form of transport? Yeah, so thank you. This, in a, this question, in a sense, if I can be informal and call everyone by first name, it comes out of Councillor Lal's uh, question. Um, uh, because where we've seen patronage decline, uh, what the National Express have come to do is to say, we're not going to be able to continue to run this 
as a commercial service. They then seek, just as your question says, a subsidy from TFWM, which again is in this budget. And the process that's been gone through this autumn is looking to see which routes that they threaten to cut, we would then subsidise. And the good news is that all apart from a very small number of routes, I think we got it down to, someone's going to have to correct me, somewhere between 10 and 15, 12. All apart from 12 routes, we have managed to maintain by using our subsidy. And actually, again, I think that is a good thing to have been done. So the straight answer is, if it wasn't for that subsidy era, those routes in communities that tend to be disconnected, because it's not the heavily used routes right on the edge of the city centre, they tend to be those on the edge of the conurbation, like your place, those are being subsidised by us. Can I just, sorry, can I just add that we have recently changed the criteria to support that subsidy for some of those services that you, you clearly mentioned. I haven't got the actual figures, I'm sure our finance director will have, but we have increased the, the potential subsidy to support those routes. That's a decision that was taken by the combined authority itself to make sure that we were trying to protect those tendered services. And you know, there is a clear issue, uh, we all recognise it, and in some areas which are not well served because patronage is so low. And that, that's really why we've changed that criteria to support some of that lack of passengers which, which actually make the service viable so you know the rural the rural sector of course we all know is not well served uh, across the piece but um, there are some other areas as well and perhaps the finance director would just give what the criteria change was for the benefits of the members Yes, we increased the value for me it was through the transport delivery committee we increased it you'll be aware um from i think it was two pounds £2.50 to £4.10 per journey. So that meant that actually by increasing that value for money criteria, we could, within our existing policy, subsidise and protect as much of that network as we, as we could afford within our budget. So as, as Councillor Slay said there, there was only 12 routes that we couldn't step in because they were too, deemed too expensive. Yeah, do you want to pick up the second question, Vera? Uh, right. I understand that there's a, there's different budgets for different things and the train budget, I understand that certain routes to, re to be reopened aren't in the main budget. Is Are these routes still going to go ahead? Yes, is the one word answer. And this is exactly what I was referring to in answering Martin's question, because you will look through this and you'll say, well, where's the cost of reopening the Walsall to Wolverhampton line? Answer, it's not here, because that was a direct award of cash for the government or actually some other capital that we put to it. Um, uh, so you, you won't see it in quite the way you'd expect. But the, yes, the diggers are in the ground. There is no threat to that programme. It is going ahead. And actually, you might be interested to know, because this is a lovely, lovely little bit of um, uh, colour on it. The train company is already running the trains along that track. They, at the timetable change, they changed it. So if you now get a train from Birmingham to Crewe, it actually goes through Hall and Darleston. So they're already running it. And when the station is built and they will open it about, well, we're aiming at February 24. So yes, the cash is secure. The train company board already made the change. <laughs> going ahead. Can I come back, Jen? So that includes the Wolverhampton line as well? You know, he's going to know which one I'm talking about. I'm not going to check. Can I mention it? Of course you can. Aldridge. Oh. <laughs> yes, is the answer to that as well. We're not as far on as we are with um, Aldridge, uh, with the Whitland Hall, Darleston, which is what I thought you were referring to, so I got that wrong. Um, that's in a slightly different place because that is to be funded through the City Region Sustainable Transport Settlement. That uh, So it still has to have its business case and be approved, but... The money is notionally allocated to it, awaiting the next stage of the business case. Whereas Willenhall Darleston, the money's there, diggers in the ground, train company rerouted the trains, da da da. Thank you. That's the rainbow. Did you want to pick up a question on HS2? Yes, thank you. Um, you recently said that HS2 was more important than ever, uh, and have announced the building of a £95 million supercar park in Sunny Hall to support it. Uh, given the expense of that project when our bus routes are, are really struggling. Um, that is, what steps are you taking to lobby the Chancellor, uh, who himself has expressed concern about HST's budget? Um, so I think the, fir the first thing the question draws out is it can't be either or. So 
I've been a firm believer in HS2 right from the start, but we've also been investing in our local transport and to come to exactly the problem we now face, the ending of the bus recovery grant in April, which is what we need to sustain that. We are pushing the Department of Transport, the lobby, to use your word, uh, to continue with that funding. Uh, we've written with other mayors on that. When I've seen them, I've talked I've talked about the importance, saw the same state of transport, we've talked about the importance of that. So it can't be either or, because they're actually doing different things that in the end complement one another. But we can't be told we can't have bus recovery grant because HS2 is being built in the future. Uh, in terms of what's happening on HS2, um, we're in a good place. So uh, in terms of the uh, lobbying, I think I've been utterly consistent on this since I've been there. Some people say that uh, I was, had some role in persuading Boris Johnson to go ahead. And similarly, uh, when the Chancellor came up uh, just about a month ago to see what's happening here, I've been absolutely uh, insistent with him and he very clearly uh, gave this decision in his autumn statement that they would press on with the full uh, commitment to HS2 as it was designed last uh, autumn. Probably worth saying a little bit about the car park in Solihull because that's been a sounds very grand, but there's a, and people say, why on earth are you spending 95 million on a car park? But let's just explain why it's a good thing to do. And Councillor Slay may well want to come in on this as well. The hybrid bill that went to Parliament back in 2015 for the London Birmingham leg assumed there would be a flat car park around the interchange relation in Solihull, and you'll be shocked by this 7,000 cars. It would have made all the area around it just car parking. It's madness. That land is probably the most precious land in the whole country, and we were going to cover it with a flat car park. The proposal that we've had to work on, and some of council have been brilliant in this, uh, their agency, the, uh, the Urban Growth Company, has been important on it, and so the landowners at, uh, around the station called Arden Cross We've all agreed with the DFT, it is much better to build a multi-storey car park. Yes, it's expensive, I know, and hopefully we can pull that down. But the whole idea is to free up lots of the land that would have been used for a, a, a flat car park so it can be used for housing, for commercial development. It is actually a much, much more sustainable solution. And encouragingly, the government have now accepted that's the right thing to do. And they've actually agreed to put 50 million of the cost in. We're putting a loan to the organ to Solihull uh, for 45 million to cover the total cost. So it sounds pretty horrendous, but it's actually an extremely wise thing to do. Please. I think that's the important point. In the base case in the bill, it was going to be a seven and a half thousand space car park, basically flat on the land. Uh, this this hub area, which sits adjacent to Birmingham Airport and the National Exhibition Centre, is is some of the most valuable retail uh, 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 land space that we have in the UK at this point in time, from the perspective of economic growth. So we want to utilise what we can within that land to raise that economic growth, with the for the benefit of the of the whole region. It stands somewhat separate from the rail it's, way itself. The Urban Growth Company, of which I'm a director, put a considerable amount of time in persuading governments that to put 7,500 cars on the space of land was really not the best thing to do with this particular site. And that's why the car park strategy itself identified the fact that the, we would only probably need something in the region of 4,500 car parking spaces, therefore releasing much more land for some very innovative housing developments, commercial developments and housing is very much needed. But equally, we know we have plans for some uh, uh, health campus, uh, university involvement. So it really, when, it, when it's complete, will actually raise the economic GVA within the region, quite a substantial sum of money, several billions of pounds. HS2 itself, of course, creates a lot of jobs. Um, you have to recognise with the railway, you don't build a railway for 10 year service, you build a railway for 150 year service and that can bring a massive amount of economic benefit to the region. So we've been consistently supportive of it going forward. Do you want to come back on? Because it's an important question and subject. On what we're doing. I think my concerns around it is, um, should that amount of money be, should we be investing in the car park to be in with or sort of promoting people to if we had a better bus service if we had better trains connecting to that link so, yeah 
So, yeah. yeah, let me let me have a go at that because it, again, it's it's useful to have this conversation because I know people are talking about this, so it's good. Um, again, there's two there's two things that need to be said. First of all, uh, we want to encourage as many people as possible to go to the HS2 station by public transport. Yeah. So it's why um, uh, we're designing a, a bus system so that it connects direct to that station, obviously. And it's why, if you think of Birmingham International Station, so well connected, we're putting in a people mover so you'll be able to go on the train from all sorts of places across the conurbation, including direct services to Walsall, Wolverhampton, and then go on a direct link straight to HS2. So you're right. Definitely going by public transport is the first thing we want to encourage, and we've given a clear commitment that no one will be more than 40 minutes, uh, no one in the West Midlands will be more than 40 minutes away from the eight, one of the two main HS2 stations. So, and encouragingly, the remodelling by HS2 of how many people, how many car parking spaces they want to provide. Originally, it was 7,000, as both Bart, myself and Councillor Slayer said, but they've now reduced that to 4,000. One of the reasons for that is the changing patterns that they're saying more people are going to use the improved public transport. So that is right. But if we're realistic, there will still be a substantial number of people who choose to drive to that place. And obviously the big point is you prefer they drive there and they get a train to London or to Manchester rather than currently drive on the motorway. So you've got to see it in that big context. It's really good news and it's no longer 7,000, it's now 4,000. The other point, of, I think, of general principle that needs to come out, because yeah, 50 million is a lot of money, but we are spending that in order to catch a lot bigger sum of money from the private sector. And again, you don't see this in our accounts because we look at our bit, but this whole concept of how we're using our capital to leverage in the private sector is how we're really going to change this place. And in that in that case of this, the car park there, yeah, we're building, we're putting 50 in, the government's putting the same to pay for the car park, but it frees up all the land. And the evidence that that's worked is Arden Cross, the landowner, have just announced a developer, a company called Muse, coming on board to do it. And they will spend hundreds of millions of pounds on developing that space out, probably a billion with other private sector investors. So we're using our bit to achieve something much, much bigger from the private sector. And that's why I think it's a defendable investment. Can I, can, can I just bring Councillor Lally and then I'll come to yourself, Councillor Kettle. I didn't, sorry, I didn't, just didn't want the subject to change. OK, fair enough. I'll, I'll bring you in after Councillor Lally. Yeah, putting the cotton, uh, Lauren Rainbow, the question was the cover. It, it is, it seems, uh, we're talking really to spend 95 million pounds on. Uh, now, if you say 95 million pounds, I assume what for 7,000 car park spaces. Now it'd be reduced to 4,000. So shouldn't the expenditure only be, be almost half? No, sorry, I should have said the calculation of 95 was done for the four, for the four, very fair interpretation of what I said. But no, it was already reduced that we then designed it for the for the for the for the, uh, for the four. It would have been more had we not already done that. Sadly. That's the kettle. Just, just go back. Yeah. Uh, good morning, and uh, apologise to everyone for being late. Uh, transport problems are going <laughs> in the car, um, but I got here finally. Uh, two aspects uh, of what you just say, uh, what you've just been saying, Andy. One, if that land is so expensive, yeah. isn't it a bit of a waste to use it on housing? That's my initial, you know, surely horses for courses. We do need houses. I'm not knocking that concept, but I just think there are locations where yeah. it seems something of a waste to build houses on some of the most expensive land in the, in, in the area, because it's so important for the economic future of the area. This is, um, I'm not saying we don't use, need, need housing, but I think should we be using houses within the, the hub? Yeah, I know the seven and a half thousand houses there. It's a tremendous scheme, and it, you know it should probably take a generation to fulfil yeah. it. Um, so I, I do question whether housing within that environment is the best use of our assets. To be honest with you, um, and then also another aspect of what you said when you said that the um, 
revised HS2 uh, budget and commitment to HS2. What, were there any significant revisions when, when we came to last October yeah. that would affect us? Let's just deal with the second question first, because it's the easier one and it's freshest in my mind. Yes, is the answer. Um, so what was decided last October was London, Birmingham goes ahead, diggers in the ground, da, da, no change. Uh, Birmingham, Manchester recommitted. Absolutely. No firm budget for it yet. And there's a risk there, but basically go ahead as planned. The change was for the eastern leg, Birmingham to Leeds. And what's now come out of the October statement for the, from the then Johnson government is that it will run from Birmingham to Nottingham only, and then from uh, East Midlands Parkway, which is where the new line crosses the old Midland main line, the trains will go up the old the Midland main line to Leeds. Mm. So using existing track. Now, if I'm honest, uh, the impact on us in the West Midlands is quite small there. We didn't have to have much. We, there was no change immediately. We lose the really fast connection to Leeds. So yes, there's some impact on us. But given the pressure on the government over funding, I think it was a fair compromise. Yeah. The good citizens of Leeds and my opposite number in West Yorkshire doesn't think so. But given the pressure the government was under, I think it was probably a wise decision because the least valuable part of the network was actually Nottingham. Leeds, and so that's the answer to that. Now, then, on your first point, Ian, it's, it's a really interesting point. I know, I know Bob will want to come in on this. Um, so. First thing to reassure you, uh, yes, there are a lot of houses at uh, uh, at uh, the Harbour Arden Cross, but so it's seven and a half thousand. No, 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 it's not that many. It was originally. Um, it was, might have been originally. The latest local plan number is, I think, about five thousand, isn't it? Bob? Yes, it's come, but it's still a lot. But if you look at the proposed land uses, a lot of land is also being used for really important commercial uh, facilities. Uh, so, for example. It's just been an announcement with Warwick University about putting a facility, a, 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 a Warwick University facility there. There's also been a discussion with the University Hospitals Birmingham about putting health innovation facilities there. There's also on the layout drawings a lot of opportunities for high tech businesses to locate. So the idea is that it is a balance, it's a mix. And I'm going to pass to Bob because this is a solid old council mm -hmm. issue. If we did not allocate some housing there, the consequences for Solihull would be very, very difficult in the local plan. So, Councillor Slable, that I think. It, yes, on that point, it, it is really a local plan issue, quite frankly, to meet the housing needs, uh, particularly within Solihull itself. We obviously have uh, population increases, and your your council also are dealing with with their local plan to identify what, what their needs are. And of course, our shared responsibility to do with the regional need where others can't meet that particular need. I would just make one point that um, the, the whole UKC pr programme actually predated HS2. So the garden suburb, whatever we care to call it, at the hub did actually predate the announcement that HS2 was going to come uh, to the to the West Midlands, particularly Solihull. So we'd always planned uh, a mixed development of housing, high tech uh, uh, businesses, and equally in recent times, issues around uh, some sort of uh, educational campus and possibly a medical facility also within that area. So it, it does meet the need. I think that's a really important point for the people within both Solihull and the wider West Midlands in parts. It doesn't deal with it all. So I think housing is very important to give that mixed development in that particular particular location. And I think that's what we've had in our minds for quite some years when I was leader and certainly the new leader is very clear that that's what we need to do. Yeah, I'm just looking at the, the national importance of the hub and the amount of, of uh, development that's going to occur over the years. Um, I'm just looking at the overall picture and thinking, well, maybe we could put everything elsewhere, you know. OK, Bob, thanks. But it's a question of sustainability, isn't it? I mean, you are creating a, a new community environment. That's what you're doing. It's not just simply industry. It's not just simply university. It is to try and recreate a place. And we've always been very keen that the idea of, of placemaking is very important for the for the hub area 
which is next to the NEC and the airport, as I said, and not far away, but quite frankly, from Jaguar Land Rover. So it's some real opportunities within the locality and Birmingham Business Park. Thanks, Ben. Thank you. Um, whilst we're still on transport, um, the CA's ambition around net zero. So in terms of transport, are we happy that we have the necessary financial resource to enable us to meet our net zero targets? So the answer here is we're doing well, but we're definitely not on target for getting to zero. But remember zero is 2041 and remember we, we broke it out into uh, into five year plans. And um, actually Laura may help me here because we were looking at this data this morning and I can't remember it sufficiently clearly enough. But there is very substantial capital going into the transport element of net zero. And there is very clear evidence that we are reducing our CO2 emissions as a region without economic uh, uh, impairment. Uh, and I think the data we were looking at this morning, Laura can might just get it up on, online, is that there has been very clear progress in that area. Now, that doesn't, as I say, that doesn't mean there's enough we're going to get to naught, but the direction of travel is extremely good. The more challenging areas, if I'm honest, because I could stop there, but because your question asked about transport, the more challenging areas is actually the decarbonisation of our homes and our heating and our industry. But on transport, the progress is actually extremely positive. We've got this. Um, I do. It's let me just open it. If you can just bear with me to open it in a it's not opening in the form that I can actually ah, okay. read it properly, right. but I will in one second. So just give me a minute to. And I think are we going to share this at the combined authority board tomorrow? Because I think this is actually really encouraging because it shows the reduction in CO2 emissions across the, the region. So, you know, we've talked about we were achieving about 4% a year. We've got to achieve 13% a year to get to net zero. And we're not at that rate, but we do actually have the, the most recent update on the progress we are, we are making. So the slide that we're a slide that will be presented uh, tomorrow subject to some further um, edits is just that in the West Midlands Combined Authority area, GDP per capita has grown to over 25,895 per capita, while carbon emissions has decreased. So that is now decreased to 3.4 tonnes of CO2 per capita. So what we're pleased to see is the lines intersecting on the graph where we can see that we can show GDP growth without um, without needing well being able to reduce emissions as well. So it's a it's quite an encouraging uh, statistic. And you're going to give me a red card for this, Laura, but can you just uh, work out, if not necessarily for now, the rate of decrease? Because that's really the critical thing on the graph because it shows the progress that's uh, been made. Yes, from 2024, uh, it looks like it was up at just around seven tons of CO2 per capita down to 3.4. That's what the graph is telling me. OK, uh, we, we can we can just turn your thing off. Um, so I'm sorry we're not right on top of the immediate data, but literally this has come out very hot off the press. But if the committee would be interested, we can circulate all of this around. Yeah, circulate tomorrow. Oh, Neil, you're, you're, you're laughing at me. What's, what, where do you want to come back? No, he's got his mic on. Oh, he's got his mic on. Oh. Oh, yeah. um, I mean, we, we've got this coming as a substantive item yeah. um, called the climate change in the new year. So the, the, the CA's progress on that. Mm. Um, so I, I suppose because this was a budget Q&A, yeah. it was trying to tease out, are there any financial, um, what are the financial constraints? Are there any financial prohibitors for us? And what do we need to leverage in to, you know, to respond to those? And the massive glaring thing at us is that while we're making good progress in transport, and we'll get all of the, the numbers so you can confirm that, we are, and we're not on our own on this, we are nowhere near having the firepower to deal with the domestic energy element of this. So uh, it was roughly a third of emissions from transport, third of emissions from home, a third of emissions from business. The transport element is going down dramatically 
and will continue to because actually the whole industry is improving its efficiency and you know all the businesses are aligned in that objective but the domestic use of the energy efficiency of our homes okay new homes are built more efficiently but the existing stock is absolutely stuck so the big resource issue is do we have the resource to deal with the retrofitting as we call it yes we've got some lovely pilots they're all very good we're learning from it but we're nowhere near having the capacity to do what we need to do and so we'll probably we'll tease this out a little yeah. bit more in the, in the paper that we receive in the new year but obviously it's a really a really critical piece for Correct. us isn't it um and particularly around the, the skills and that, that agenda to make sure that you know we can't retrofit if we haven't got the skills to do it with um councillor singh thank you uh, just on this point um obviously combined authority have a large program of uh, investment and stuff i understand that retrofitting is, is a issue for the utilization of new funding for that but we are spending money new money we are spending on projects and stuff would it be possible that you can emphasize that if we are having any new project any buildings new created with the public funds must be carbon neutral or zero completely green whatever we are building new yes is the answer to that so again we have to think about where we can actually impact this because we can't set the planning rules. Actually, the local authorities are far more influential there. And of course, in a sense, you are governed by a national position there. But I would like, on public record there, I would like to see the government moving faster and bringing forward new standards and then local authorities implementing them. What we can influence though, is any of the housing and regeneration funds that we allocate and we've talked about we've got substantial sums again you've seen that in here and we are demanding uh now we have to i have to be really careful with my words here we are not yet demanding literally carbon neutral because actually in some areas that's a little out of reach still but we are constantly trying to improve uh, what developers offer and we judge that they we weight that very heavily in our assessment of their applications. So that's how we influence this, not through the planning piece. I think if I'm honest, you could push us uh, on when will we get to an absolute demand of carbon neutrality on the projects that we support. I would like to get to that. I actually do not know uh, if we insisted on that, exactly the consequences of that at the moment. And certainly it's not what local authorities are demanding in their planning. So um, uh, we could explore that, because I think it is a fair thing to call out, but we are certainly waiting it and pushing it, but not quite to that extent that you might advise. Yeah. Uh, I completely agree. I think planning have a lot of role to play. But when the public funding is going to work, and that should be one of the conditions. We can't influence the planning in a, in a normal way correct um, way, yeah. and we are doing that i think it's the question of exactly how tough we can be as legislate as background legislation moves <laughs> I mean, just to add a comment to that i mean I, you know i've always been interested as to how we can build in mitigations for developers so where they're developing a, a scheme of i don't know so many hundreds or thousands houses we know that the um production of concrete is hugely hugely problematic and air polluting so what are the mitigators that they can build in and what can we in, um, in terms of that and then how we can weight our um you know with who we give that, those um, those contracts to so i'm heartened that we are having those thoughts yeah. and considerations um and i seriously hope that local authorities all around the, the West Midlands take that on board and will act with that That's because right. it is absolutely critical and it's not shouldn't just be the numbers game. I agree. Yeah. Well said. Yeah. Uh, do I have any last questions? Uh, there's no more questions on transport to pick up. No? Okay, so if we move back then um, and back to financial challenges and yeah. to investment programme. Um, 
Councillor Kettle, we've got one from you with the speed of funding you were concerned about. Yes, um, you know, in the, in the previous discussion the, uh, about a week ago, um, it was highlighted in the, uh, the budget that £5 million had been allowed um, for the pay award. My question was, did that £5 million include the pension contributions? Yeah. Yep. Um, okay. Obviously, if it didn't, the actual award was less than 5% or what was discussed. If it did, it was more. It more. Yes. Yeah, so you're absolutely right. You know, it's a, it's a good question, um, and I will answer it. But Linda uh, might need to come in because it's the most technical question we've had yet. She has tried to brief me and Councillor Slay on it, but I, and I think I'm clear on it. Uh, but Linda, correct me if I'm not. Um, so the straight answer is the five percent percent, not million, uh, is actually a pure pay. That's what's in the budget for next year. But you are right. There is a different line, which is around pensions, which is actually on top of that. And there has been a uh, actuarial valuation, which, you know, every pension scheme goes through every, I think it's three years you have to do. And what that has concluded is we need to increase the rate of our pension contributions. So you, uh, you are right that actually the pension increase is more than 5%, be, not because we're just increasing people's pay by 5%, therefore pensions would naturally go up by 5%, but because of this examination of the actuarial valuation, we need to increase the rate of pension contributions as well as just paying people's salary increases. So it is going up faster than the five percent to answer your question so in, in, in reality um the five percent or the five million is pretty soft figure really it, it, it's got to increase hasn't it uh, yeah. so the, the, it's the assumption that's in the budget for next year my personal view is that it's got it has got to be that you we can see what's happening with public sector pay movement at the moment Obviously, this year, the average for public sector pay movement is 2.6. Given where inflation is, I think that is a prudent assumption to make for next year, that it will be 5%. But Linda, just explain to everyone led by Ian about how we move from the assumption to what it actually turns out at for public sector pay. Yes, clearly, um, there is a uh, negotiation uh, through... we. we as a combined authority, we are not bound by the local government uh, pay award when that's settled. However, we do tend to follow it and we take negotiation through the union to follow the award. So we will follow the, the local government pay negotiations. They, they have just concluded for the year that we're currently in, but they have, the negotiations have started for the pay award due 1st of April 2023. It could be that they're finalised before then. It, if history if history repeats, it probably won't get finalised until into the new financial year. We have a budget provision of 5%. We will ensure that, uh, or our advice to uh, our negotiators will be, anything above that is, is unaffordable. But clearly we will want to uh, try and reflect what the local government settlement is and if it is if it turns out to be less than that we have a saving in our budget then next year if it turns out to be more than that we have to we will have to then look to where we can make savings elsewhere in the budget to be able to afford anything above the five mm -hmm. yeah, I, 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 the only thing i could say is that when it is declared what the actual settlement is mm -hmm. that the overall costs are made aware to the public that it, it does include the pension contributions. Good, so nobody said I get 5%, but I'm on 21.4% because I'm top. And in, in local government, that's the figure. In the National Health Service, same with the doctors, it's 25.6%, which is significant. So as long as you state the overall picture, inclusive of the, of the pension costs, yeah. I, I think that's perfectly normal. And that's why it should be done. This there's two different things going on here, though. There's a 5% increase in the uh, pay rate, and then there's a contribution rate 
which is what you've described as 21 percent. Our contribution rate, getting Linda to speak enables me just to pull this out, look at the piece of paper because I couldn't remember this stat off the top of my head. The proposed contribution rate for the next year is 14.9 percent. Yeah, uh, and that that rate has gone up. So of course, you pay you five percent, and you pay an increased rate on top of it. So you get a sort of compounding, and that's what your question was getting exactly. at. Yeah, exactly. yeah. I think we're on side there, aren't we? Yeah, yeah. yeah. We're on side. yeah. yeah. That's all gone in the budget assumptions. Is the point? Yeah. Thank you, uh, Councillor Tennant. Yeah, I just wanted why we're talking about pay and you reference that if high inflationary pressures at the moment. Um, does that pay award um, give uh, more money to people lower down on the pay scale? Less headroom in their budget to face these increased inflationary pressures. It is it's a financial assumption that I have made in the budget that the cost to the authority will be an increase on the current pay budget of 5% on the current budget in financial terms. How the, lo how the local government negotiators through the NJC ultimately arrive at what that pay award is, we will, we will honour and follow, but that, that negotiation is still to be had. All I've got at the minute is an assumption in our budget that the overall impact, the affordability impact from our perspective, is 5% on top of the current pay. That's the thing. Thank you, Jim. Sorry, just speak up. I didn't. Sorry. My question is basically because Combined Authority is involved in a lot of big project, investment projects. Uh, it's mentioned that there is a single assurance framework. It goes through quite a lot of stuff, the appraisal assurance. This moment. I want to know if we, we get like a accountability built in it. Mm -hmm. There's quite a lot of time when things go wrong, public sector pick up the tab for these things. <laughs> Are we getting in the habit where you can assure me that accountability actually does work? And at every stage. Yeah. And that's the one thing uh, I don't find most of the time when I'm looking to scrutinize things, that accountability is missing. So things go wrong, we we'll find out, but there is nothing get done why it went wrong. And the people who take a large chunk of money from public purse, they are all responsible. So I want to know what, uh, is, what we are doing in combined authority to make sure accountability is embedded. Yeah. It's a very good question. Uh, uh, Councillor Slay is whispering in my ear. I think he might. Do you want to start this time, Bob? Yeah. So there are a number of areas where we, we actually build in accountability in any funds that we actually apply. I think that's probably the, the nub of the question that you're actually asking. The single assurance framework itself has a monitoring and evaluation process within it. So I think it's for memory is section four. I think I would recommend that you can have a look at it. But equally on the on the addition, the other funds that we apply, we apply a certain element of criteria for the outputs we're looking to achieve. So for instance, if I take the four funds that the investment board actually monitors outside the investment programme, that would be the revolving investment fund, the brownfield land property development fund, and the uh, collective investment fund, for, to name three of them. The other one is the Black Country Fund, which is measured by the Black Country Local Enterprise Partnership. We actually looked for outputs within that, and at each investment board meeting, and Councillor Kepler has been there on occasions, we actually have a dashboard which indicates how many jobs we've created, how many homes we've created, what the uplift in GVA is that we've had, um, uh, and how much land we've remediated. So we do actually monitor those quite clearly as against any funds that we apply. The one other criteria which I think is important comes back to housing, for instance. We have an affordability criteria in any investment we make into housing that we require 20% affordable homes within any investment that we make, which actually is is better than some local authorities within the West Midlands. So we would say if we as a combined authority invest in that particular housing development, we would want 20% affordability. 
So to offer you an assurance, there are available public dashboards within the investment board minutes and papers which would indicate to you or give you a clear indication of what we've created by way of outputs in monitoring where our investments go. But equally, that's uh, absolutely clearly expressly provided for within the single assurance framework that is uh, is basically the, the, the means by which we actually say we have to comply with uh, we comply with that. Does that does that help in any way? Um, on uh, uh, on the surface, it does look like uh, yeah, that you are taking care of this. For quite a long time, we hear that uh, you know, the, in the housing, a twenty percent of the housing will be affordable. But once the time passed by, the developers are saying, you know, we can't afford it. Okay. It's reduced, or the type of housing they were supposed to offer as affordable, that changed because that is that doesn't address the needs of the communities. I think it's a good point that you make, but let's just let's just clarify. Uh, matters with regard to the meeting of those targets is often within the planning process. Uh, and you, you're, you're very aware of that. And I think the point you're making is sometimes developers will agree to an affordability criteria, but then they come back and say it's just not affordable from our perspective, and therefore we want to reduce those elements. That's very much a matter for the local authority in that regard. From our perspective, what we invest in, it's a, it's a criteria for us to demonstrate that we would only invest where there was 20% affordable agreed within the agreement for our financial elements of the of the investment that's how we that's how we measure it can i add two things is everything that builds on what councillor slay said just on this point about the affordable housing though it just as councillor slay said the investment board takes review so does the housing and land board and they do monitor the actual achievement of affordable yeah. housing and the current rate is running at 27 yeah. percent but that's just in a sense, one step that you drew out of us, but it enables us to make the wider point, which is all of our boards now, our sub boards, are looking at the actual delivery. As the organisation matures, has got more spending in, in train, rather than actually just talking about what it's doing in the future, there's a lot more to review and the processes are there in each board to do that. And of course, when the government then looks at the funding that it's allocated to us, it makes us demonstrate that we've hit the criteria. So again, if we take housing as the example, when we go back to the government and say, tranche three of our housing deal said we'd do this, we have to say this many square foot of commercial property has been developed, this many homes, this many affordable. So it is all there. Now, Cathy might say this is the last thing she wants, but I think there is a legitimate question for the overview and scrutiny committee as to whether the, as the mature organisation matures, whether there's more time looking at the outputs achieved uh, and we perhaps need to think with you about how we bring that information which goes to each board in a way in which you can see yeah. that's definitely a development over recent years. Thank you, we'll, look, we'll have a look at that, thank you. Yeah. Did you want to come back again to the scene or are you happy? Um, yeah. I, I am aware that the local authority have more to say on these things, but because you are part of that, that's why I raise this. Another thing would be that if uh, I know Coventry, we have a whistleblowing blows policy. Do you have a similar kind of thing in combined authority? A whistleblower. Most definitely. Uh, yeah. Most definitely, and I can reassure you, it's used. <laughs> so uh, yes, that's there. And again, if you want to look at the policy piece, Laura would. Easily supply that for you, but it's used uh, reasonably frequently. Uh, Councillor Lau. Thank you, Chair. Uh, following on uh, the same uh, question, uh, Mr. Mayor, how many housing were supposed to build? <coughs> and have we achieved the target, or we are having reached the target? And how many sources of housing we have built so far? Uh, uh, second is following the council of JB10 question, we are allowing 5% uh, pay increment. So with the cost of living crisis, inflation is going double figures. How realistic we are that 5% is adequate to deal with the yeah. uh, uh, claims? Okay, okay right. Two, um, two very different questions. So, um, I'll give you all the numbers around housing. Uh, 
But I think in a sense, your question is fascinating because it illustrates to me we probably do need to do a better job of bringing you the outputs, actually. Uh, so the target number of new homes between 2016 and 2031 is 215,000. It's a huge number, even the biggest number outside London. And what we did in our housing deal with government in 2018, we broke it down by a number per year. And it was slightly increasing per year, uh, but it was about um, 15 and a half thousand per year. Pre-COVID, we were running nicely ahead of that number. Uh, in COVID affected year, we fell a bit, we fell actually quite a bit behind 12,000, but we are actually back on target now and clearing it. And if you look at the total period since the housing deal, the one word answer is yes, we are on target with our housing number. And that is huge credit to every local authority in the West Midlands that have come together to do that. So I think we are pretty much unique in the country of being able to say yes to that question. So within that total number, we also know the affordable number, which I gave the percentage, it is about 27% uh, for the things that we influence. The total number across the West Midlands is about 4,000 affordable homes uh, per year, obviously the maths of that. Uh, but the really interesting thing in your question is social homes. So truly affordable. We do not build ourselves social homes. Uh, and even across the whole of the West Midlands, the total number of social homes is very, very small. And this is why we are asking government and your city council would totally support this. This is why we are asking government in the next Trailblazer deal a specific fund for social homes, because that is what is not being done. Hopefully that is clear at every level. Yeah. Five percent. Five percent. Sorry. Yeah, it, it, it's straightforward. This this is an assumption at the moment. We will hopefully fall in line with the local government negotiation more broadly. And if obviously as that goes on through next year, inflation doesn't come down, uh, general movements in the pay market change, I'm sure there'll be upward pressure on it. But at the moment, given that we expect inflation to come off very quickly, it seems to me a sensible type uh, assumption. Just while we're talking about the um, outcomes yeah. um, and, and Councillor Fenton, who is yeah. unfortunately not able to be with us today, she'd wanted to ask how do we monitor the success of investments in terms of the types of jobs created um, and, and, and the value for money that we get through that and the value for the economy. So I guess a bit like you, your housing, how do we quantify the uh, the outputs? Yeah. So interesting, even housing has a, a job output. Um, so in a sense, the answer is the same. Every single project that comes through the process then has to have an assessment. So I'll give you a really good example of this because it was only in the press yesterday, but people were thinking, ah, yes. So we had cash for what we call our Connected Communities programme. And we did the story yesterday in the press, which obviously in the headline, that that programme generated uh, 1,100 people into employment. And it's a really specific example of the general point I'm calling out, that whenever we get allocated a funding line, we have to, at the conclusion of it, certainly if it's a government funding line or one of ours, we have to come back and say, did we achieve the outcome? Now, I will probably be corrected by either Councillor Slay or Linda in this. I don't think we're necessarily as good as the questioner implies around the, the type of jobs that are created, but we certainly are very diligent in the total number of jobs that are created. And if we look through the skills uh, total programme, which of course is a huge budget every year of 140 million, uh, uh, million of AEB, every two weeks, the director gives me an output of where we are against the targets that we're supposed to achieve. And again, no difficulty in sharing that around. So it's done again in a very rigorous way. And I think part of the issue here is what we're choosing to share with and you're choosing to examine in these meetings. Yeah, and I think, I guess, Ellen being from um, one of the Black Country authorities and um, when we did the Black Country deep dive, it was very clear that job uh, levels were re were fairly low um, there were very few there were a smaller number in the black country of managerial technical and professionally qualified roles that were coming out so i think it, I, i'm guessing that her emphasis was around 
the levels and the quality of those jobs in order to um, you know, be able to uh, promote the local economy. Um, because if we are getting people into lots and lots of low paid jobs or um, temporary work or time limited work, then whilst there's a positivity to that, it needs to go a lot further. Um, Can I just, um, just highlight the, the fact that I think we have been fairly innovative in the way we've dealt with some of these issues. So if we take apprenticeships, for instance, by the work we did to actually collectively work on, as it were, unutilised apprentice levy. Um, I was recently looking at the figures in that. I think we had supported over 2,000 retained or new jobs utilising the apprentice levy that we collectively utilised through our training programmes for, I think, something well over 900 small to medium sized enterprises. Those are the figures that I actually had within my portfolio to look at. So I think we have been able to demonstrate that we are quite innovative in trying to make sure that we do support some of those skilled jobs. And most apprenticeships, you know, I was an apprentice myself, has a have a level of training and skills uh, promotion. So I think we have we have demonstrated we can do that if we're given the opportunity to do that. And I think the uh, our, our initiative in bringing that apprentice levy together to apply in those areas has been able to demonstrate that we are able to do that. But I think you're right. I mean, I don't don't dispute what you say. If you look at the range of, of those uh, job opportunities, I don't doubt that probably what you say is correct. And it's uh, it's a, it's an insight that I think we all need to understand and share. And it's fair what you say, Chair. But I think, again, two things I'd probably draw about what we're trying to do to address this. So if you think of our overall economic strategy and plan for growth, we're actually focusing on the clusters that can develop good jobs, sustainable jobs, not any job. So it's apps that that point that you're making is taken right into our thinking, which are the sectors that have above average pay rates to create good jobs. So that. And that applies across the whole region. But we've tried to answer the point in that sectoral way. And where we've also tried to answer the point, and again, we could draw out this for you if you wish, is look at how we're using our skills money for e-work progression. So it's not just about getting people into their first job, but it's actually to take people whose perhaps careers are not going very far in the way that what they chose some years ago to help them retrain or even in their existing employer uh, to actually move through. So uh, quite a large proportion of our expenditure is on in-work progression to again to try to address the, uh, the pay rates people have. Because you are right, if you stand back from the West Midlands economy, one of the <laughs> issues is that too high a proportion of people are in relatively low paying jobs. So you try to address that either by changing the composition of the economy or by changing the skills of those people in that position, both of which we're trying to act upon. Thank you. So I've got um, Amanda next and then Councillor Singh. <coughs> Thank you, Chair. Um, as a member of the Black Country Left, I also sit on the funding subgroup that meets every month and looks at some of the outputs that you've just been describing, uh, May. Um, one of the key reports we get at every meeting every month is with regard to commitments against LPIF, so the Land and Property Investment Fund. And as you'll be aware, 53 million was committed and that's broadly there now in terms of being fully, fully awarded. However, there is a 97 million gap. Uh, which was predicated upon the initial 53 million being committed. I'm very conscious now with the left economic responsibilities transferring into the combined authority from April. I guess I'm looking to seek a commitment that that 97 million won't be lost now that there isn't there won't be the monthly scrutiny uh, through the Black Country Left funding subgroup. So I need to be quite robust with you, to be honest. That's how you see it. It is not how it is. So there was never, and I've had uh, I've had written communication with 
the uh, previous flat country LEP chair about this. It was never a firm commitment that the 97 million would follow through to the black country LEP. There was in the original devolution deal talk about uh, substantial uh, sums uh, for further uh, brownfield remediation, and they have followed. Uh, but the issue is they haven't been placed with the black country LEP. So I'm sorry, I can't allow the committee to think that there is a sort of IOU that's got to be honoured. That is not the case. It doesn't change the policy objective and what we're all trying to work on together, but there is not an outstanding payment to be made to whatever the successor body of the Black Country left is. I'm sorry to be robust, but there's no point in me allowing people to think something that isn't right. Uh, thank you. I can only report on what's been reported through to the Black Country Left. I think it still remains important, uh, irrespective of whether that commitment is there or not, that um, there is you know, the Black Country region um, is remains a top priority for land to property investment. And I guess that commitment, uh, you know, in the context of there not being a black country left, advocating on that uh, perspective into yeah. the future. Yeah. So on that, we agree wholeheartedly. Uh, and if you look at funding, that is, there's a chart somewhere in the papers yeah, yeah. about uh, how much money has been invested in each local authority. I know Walsall's the lowest, there may be a question about that, but if you add up the totals that that chart uh, reflect, it is far more than the £53 million pounds that, uh, Bob's got it in front of him, far more than the £53 million pounds that was allocated through the Black Country Lab. And there will be, if we're successful in our negotiation through the Trailblazer devolution deal, far more uh, brownfield remediation money, which almost naturally, because of the nature of the place, will get skewed towards the black country because I hope the council and Coventry won't mind me saying this there isn't as much uh, opportunity in Coventry and Solihull as there is in the black country so I'm not questioning the objective I'm being quite precise about this notion that has been around for a number of years it is not right that there's a sort of IOU over this 97 million pounds thank you uh, Councillor Singh Thanks, Jen. My question is in addition to what you were saying about sorry. Um, yeah, frequently I find out when there is a like big project like HS2, say Curtin Street, they are like world class projects. And when it comes to say uh, having opportunity for local people, again, frequently I find the large top, the two layer or three layer of these project people who are involved in these projects are normally are not from local area. So what I I understand the apprentice apprenticeship is very important for us and making clusters and having education is all fantastic. But these projects give us the opportunity to upskill other people. So I would like like from uh, your side some kind of uh, say pressure or commitment that every project of these world class projects when they come to our region, we should insist that top layer, top three layers should mentor people from local area. So that other people get upskilled. So again and again, I find these massive projects we generate so much money, but I find frequently the top layer is not from local area. And I do have that kind of exposure to even our people that other people can compete against these things. We need to create those kind of spaces where mentoring for our people take place, especially when we are funding these things. So I just want some kind of <laughs> Commitment or pressure or some policy from you. Yeah, so I think we again I'd ask you to look at the evidence of what we've done um, uh, to show that we get this and have tried to act on it. But let's let's take HS2 because that's the biggest project that you mentioned. Um, I was with their managing director uh, two weeks ago and he was introducing the thousand apprentice. Um, I think they were all from Birmingham, the three, three apprentices with him. I think they were all from Birmingham, but they have taken, a, you know, that's quite an impressive number. And a, a huge number of them are local students or let's say student apprentices. So that's, I think, a clear example of how a really big national project tried to be relevant locally. 
They, of course, also have their head office here, so they've tried to embed themselves in the community. Another example of what we've done, um, if you look at their procurement and subcontracting, an allegation is often that it all goes to big national companies. But we've done two workshops with the CEO of uh, HS2, with SMEs across the West Midlands, to enable them to bid for those contracts. Now, to be fair, they can't be the national level um, uh, constructor. That's Balfour BT Finchie, who of course got a West Midlands base on Hagley Road, actually. Um, but they have taken on lots of subcontractors themselves. They've now got 2,500 SME subcontractors, again, a large proportion of whom are from the West Midlands. And take a completely different thing if you look at the Commonwealth Games uh, and how that money was spent. They very proudly said 75% of their expenditure has been with companies who have a West Midlands presence. So we are genuinely trying where there are these national big sets of money to make sure that they impact either companies or individuals through training, training on training of the games. 7,500 local people got new skills on the back of the games and programs and we got the funding for them now. I think the evidence is that we are trying to respond to what you say. I, I don't disagree with that. I think uh, on apprentices, we were doing fantastic work. My emphasis was just on the top layer of it. That's that we should emphasize that those people who are you know, working at that level, our people should get a chance to do med mentoring with them. And I say, I insisted that in City of Cultures organization, and large, almost all the top layer basically mentored somebody, apart from I think one, one person. Uh, so that's the kind of thing I'm emphasizing. Yeah. That. And it, it, it's a good tip. And I do know that HS2 directors do that. They have reverse mentoring as well. So yeah, it's good. I don't disagree. It's good practice. Thank you. Um, I've got a question around the um, the growth, the West Midlands Growth Company. I yes. know there's a paper going to yes. board tomorrow. Um, and I know that we've funded the growth company. I think about seven million a year, seven hundred thousand a year. We um, funded them. Seven hundred k. Seven hundred k's future, but we have funded them more in the past. Right. So I, I suppose my question around it is: I mean, I know that they're, they're seeking an additional funding um, supplement tomorrow, but how how do we quantify the return that we we get from the growth company, and how do we quantify the value for money? that we, we are getting from the growth company. I suppose it's a little bit back to council listings, um, assurance framework um, to make sure that these, the, you know, that this is embedded and that we do, we, we do understand what that value is. Um, <laughs> um, I'm going to be slightly provocative again because I was with Amanda, I will be again here. Um, I actually think this is a bargain. Uh, and I think that um, us only putting in 0.7 million is tiny. This is the region's inward investment company. And uh, every year we get a graph from central government shows the number of jobs that is being produced as a result of inward investment in each region. It's usually about 4,900 here has been the sort of strike rate for the last few years. And we have been for five years in a row, second only to London. Now, no one's going to say that all those jobs are directly the result of the growth company. It's a team effort, it's much wider than that. Some would probably have happened, frankly, with no intervention. The point I'm trying to draw out is this inward investment piece is absolutely critical to the future of our economy. And if the government ain't going to spend much more money, consumers are very stretched, businesses are spending less in the UK, then foreign businesses to invest becomes so important. And what are we doing? We're arguing about whether or not, not saying you are, but there's been lots of debate about whether 0.7 million pounds is appropriate. We are kidding ourselves if we think we're going to get this any cheaper in any other way. And we need to, we need to frankly <laughs> put, put our money where our mouth is in wanting good investment. Now that's a rather a sort of rant and an overview statement. What we also have to do is hold the growth company accountable for their outputs. So what they are required to do is show their KPIs of how many projects they've brought in and the jobs that they have uh, secured. And that actually, again, is very public. And we could, if we wanted to, we could say the cash for each job brought in is X. But I honestly think, Chair, that this is a, uh, this is a very clear decision that we have 
to get behind them as a critical agency in, in a very, very competitive international environment. And I think it was just then, I think it was just the, the, the tack from my, my question was around um, the deliver, what, what's being delivered and the value of money. And when, you know, I think we've just had the city ready figures out um, this week that show an increase in um, unemployment across the region. Right. Um, so, you know, marrying the two together. So we've got an increase in, in jobless across the region. And then we're looking at an increase to the growth company. So what are we looking to get from our additional investment to help address some of those shortfalls that we see in, in the market, in the jobs market? And that's entirely fair. And it's also entirely fair that growth should be scrutinised properly because it's public money. I'm not questioning that. I'm, I'm sort of in that. Is this a really important thing we do really well in and we've got to resource ourselves properly for it? To be precise, we're not seeking an increase. The previous run rate, and Linda will correct me, I think was about 2.2, I was going to say 2.2, Linda says 2.5 million a year. So we're actually putting in a reduction, assuming that the paper tomorrow is, is, uh, is agreed because we will get the rest of the money from the Commonwealth Games under spend and from the UK Shared Prosperity Fund, both of which are central government funds. So actually for the region itself, it is a reduction in commitment. And as I say, the job numbers, they held accountable for what they deliver. Thank you. Just, can I just add, Cathy? Yeah. Um, I mean, it's a very fair point that you make. Um, I think what we now have in place uh, with the growth company going forward, we are conducting a review of the growth company, which I think will report sometime at the end of January, beginning of February. Uh, and the governance around the outputs and the outcomes for the growth company will be monitored through the Economic Growth Board. Very clearly defined set of KPIs will be determined and therefore we will be able to measure very closely the outputs and the outcomes that the, that the growth company produced. Um, the previous £700,000, and Linda will correct me if I'm wrong, was based on the business plan that we took at the point in time where we agreed the £700,000 annually from the investment programme. But I think we're in a slightly different place now, and I think that the assurance you'll be looking for, and that we'll certainly be looking for going forward, it is in train from the review, and then ultimately agreeing the KPIs with the growth companies who'll be able to measure the, the success. And then within the paper, which is going to the board tomorrow, it does actually sort of outline some of those proposed out, outputs and outcomes that the growth company uh, are going to bring forward. So I think we we we, we think it's a, a good investment. Thank you, Councillor McGarrity. I'm actually also apologise for being late. I'm trying to I'm interested in the point that you made about the Commonwealth Games and money that's been saved. I was just wondering where that money is going to be invested. Hopefully, it'll be in young people getting jobs or getting to see what I just mentioned. But I'd be interested in that money is going to be used. With pleasure, very timely. And as uh, the chair will know, there's a paper on this for the board tomorrow. So I'll tell you what the paper says, but obviously, as ever, it's subject to agreement by all the leaders tomorrow. Uh, so, uh, first of all, the amount we are optimistic that um, there'll be about £70 million coming back to the combined authority on behalf of the whole region. There's also a separate sum going back to Birmingham, which reflects their contribution. So it can be a separate debate with Birmingham City Council about what they do with it. The £70 million is very clearly for the whole region. What the paper tomorrow does is it talks about the pillars, the four different pillars, the pots in broad terms that this will be spent on. And the first one is all around uh, economic development. So that does include the money we've just been talking about for the growth company. It will include, as you say, some skills and economic development piece, and it will include some major events, subsidies in the future. Now, exactly what it will be is not in the paper tomorrow. It's just agreeing the overall process and the pot. We will be waiting for applications to come forward for those individual things. So what I'm giving is the suggestions of what type of thing will be in there. The second pot 
will be around community investment. Yeah. Uh, and that's, again, pretty broad heading. I suspect some of it will be, uh, a lot of it will be around sport in communities. The third part, um, and they're the two biggest pots, by the way, the third part will be around a cultural development fund, heritage and culture, because as we saw in the games, actually the cultural um, contribution of an area is a key part of the sort of cohesion of a place. So there's some there. And the fourth pot, I've forgotten who can remind me on the fourth well -being. pot. Well-being. Oh, the well-being pot. So, uh, yeah, well, that's the clues in the title, isn't it? So, and again, and you'll, you'll all say to me there's overlap because, of course, well-being, that's based, that we want to make sure that's very much based in a community's activities, addressing the health inequalities report, all of that. The link between that and jobs and uh, skills is obviously huge. So there is overlap, but they are broadly the pots that there will be. If that's agreed tomorrow, and when we actually finally get the money out of government, and Laura's working hard on that, we'll then be sort of open for applications to come forward uh, for how that money will actually be spent. But that's really interesting. I'm, I'm glad I'm actually a mental health nurse myself, so I'm pleased that you know, the well-being part of, part of that will be used, hopefully, to improve <laughs> the mental health of the community yeah. and the area. And also, I've been struck by, in the past, we've had sports events, and initially, there's been a lot of interest from children, and that's kind of waned off. So maybe there's more encouragement for sports to keep yeah. that going yeah. and reduce the obesity that's very yeah. prevalent in the city. And, and that type of thing would be a perfect, a really good project in that area, would be a perfect piece to come under either the wellbeing or actually the community's uh, heading as well. We are, interestingly, it's not part of the legacy money, but we're also working with Sport England, yeah. who've got a substantial sum on a partnership to do further um, follow-up activity as well. And remember, they have invested, I think the sum is nearly £30 million pounds in the West Midlands on the back of the Games, and there's still a lot of live projects in that area. So they're also focused very much on the area you just uh, talked about. Can I make just one other point, because it, it, it sort of should be said this, because uh, everyone, quite rightly, given it's the current debate, goes to how we're going to spend the underspend. But we should just spend a moment on it's remarkable that there is this underspend and those responsible for managing the budget deserve huge credit for the way in which that was done. You don't hear of many public projects of this scale that achieve an underspend. So uh, credit where it's due to everyone who's brought that back. Can I add something? Yeah, of course you can. Can I just add something, I think, particularly in relationship to your... Um, your professional capacity. Uh, I mean, undoubtedly, there's a link between sport and well-being, which I think Sport England recognise with regard to the legacy that the Commonwealth Games would bring. Uh, I had the pleasure recently of going to uh, an organisation in Coventry who received some grant um, by way of equipment from Sports England from the Commonwealth Games, and they support a large number of young people to play basketball, actually, and are drawn from a very wide range of communities, but all of them being supported to create the link between sports and well-being. So I think you, know, you recognise that, we recognise that, certainly Sport England recognise that, and there's a lot more of, of those opportunities now coming to the fore with our relationship with Sport England and the local authorities who are supporting some of those projects. So there's a lot of good work being done. Thank you very much. Uh, Councillor Waters. We spoke about um, apprenticeships. Uh, I think there's a gap in people who are not 18 to 24 that actually need upskilling and training. There's a well-known car manufacturer, which I'm not going to name, which is actually crying out for people with skills to go and work with them. And at the moment, there are not any coming forward. The attention on the people keeping the jobs in the in the place is very is very low, and they're actually looking at using agency staff to actually get the jobs done. So I suspect we can all guess the car maker you're referring to. So I think it's 
it sort of links back to what I said earlier on about how we use our budget for upskilling those who are already in work and the particular area that this manufacturer, if we've got the right one, is saying they need people, is people with IT and digital skills at the moment. Not no. Well, that is what they've gone to the market and they said they're looking for 800 people no. with those skills. That's their recruitment. And they talked about 300 apprentices in another uh, PR this week. So the single, so we are in touch with them about the big IT piece. But the point I wanted to get to is that even if it's not that car manufacturer, the biggest number of vacancies in this region at the moment, just when unemployment is going up, the chair is right, is, and we had this data earlier this week, is software engineers. That is the skill we are most short of, even more than nurses and teachers, those things. And the growth in that sector is enormous. So we then try to bring it back to the budget piece. What we're trying to use, the budget that we have, and indeed our encouraging our colleges, is really the development of people with those digital and IT skills. And so our digital boot camps, which is, I think, won another £14 million pounds there. There's 8,000 more places. So it's really at a significant scale. And that's what we understand from all the data and indeed the direct conversations, including the unnamed car manufacturer, that where the biggest need is in the market. And that's the point of principle is we're trying to put our cash behind those areas of needs. I need other skills, come and tell me. Yeah. I will. Thank <laughs> you after. All right. That's the kettle. <laughs> <laughs> economic activity sort of in the West Midlands. Uh, yes, better, better uh, caliber jobs will always be beneficial. But fundamentally, to some of the big schemes that come into the into the locality, into the economic environment, I think we need to tie in uh, the food chain, the supply chain, and local labour fundamentally into many of these schemes. Uh, Malaysia years ago, Australia uh, have done very well out of it. Glasgow have done very well out of it. They, uh, they, I think they worked with a couple of them. Like Alpine uh, some years ago. And eventually they found it was so successful for both, both parties that um, tying in what I call the food chain, the supply chain and, and local labour into the um, uh, investment and the commitment to come into the area turns out to be very beneficial to everyone and i think we must look at this area especially in, in electricity the electricity means the the pit that, w that really drains money out the electricity out, out of the uh, west midlands area and if the food chain uh, supply chain applied more to things like electricity especially and, and the creation of, of energy um I think it would do the, uh, the local economy for a, a, a tremendous amount of good, you know. I think there's something we've got to do there, Andy. You're right. I mean, the point of principle about, sorry, the point of principle of tying um, employers into the local e economy, where they're making investment. you mentioned McAlpine, so let's just talk about the construction sector briefly. Again, we are trying to do this. I'm not saying we've got all the answers, but just acknowledge the point. So where we have a major investor the big construction project, we then offer what we call a skills hub on their site. I've done a number of them. We did it for City of Culture. We did it for the Commonwealth Games. We did it for the big motor thing on uh, Five Ways. We did it at Perry Bar. Uh, and so we actually say we will produce, I think it's about 300 people for the motor one on Broad Street, go through our skills hub that are used specifically there. So it makes sure, to the earlier question, that uh, it's training up local people for the jobs in that site. So that's that's the general point. Now, the energy one is particularly interesting. And in sense, I wasn't expecting this this morning. It's more of a strategic question, this. I think the simplest to say this morning is you are right. And the energy vulnerability of our firms is huge. So what we can do to, won't necessarily be as much manufacturing of energy here, but storage of it, distribution of it, what we can do on energy efficiency is a huge area. And what we are, uh, again, looking for in our travel laser devolution deal is specific funding to do more of the trials we've done in the black country around the repowering the black country, as we called it, because we have got a lot of incredibly vulnerable firms. So I think you are spot on and it needs to play a much bigger role in our economic strategy. Thank you. Um, 
We now at the, just up just before 10 to, 10 yep. to 12. So, um, and Councillor Rainbow have got a really important question around investment zones, but yes. she'd sadly had to leave. So if I can raise that with you yep, um, and look for a response, please, from you on, um, obviously, the, there are a number of investment zones in the West Midlands that yep. were being considered, um, certainly one in, in Dudley. Yep. Um, how, and then the government changed yep. direction. Um, so how much money was spent on the aborted work and what will there be any value or benefit brought forward as a result of the work that was previously undertaken with whatever the new plans might be? I think, but I might just ask Laura to make sure I'm not wrong about this. I think the answer on how much money is nothing in the sense of all the work was done in-house, both by the CA that had to assemble them and by each local authority. And I say I think because I'm utterly certain that that's correct for the WMCA. I can't be totally certain that that was right for every local authority. But as I understand it, everybody did it on in-house resources. Now, of course, everyone could say, well, that resource could have been doing something else. So there was an opportunity cost but we definitely didn't have beef and salt and bills um, assembling all of this. Thank you. And then the second half of the answer must be it's not necessarily wasted uh, because although they have uh, changed course, there will, and I confirmed this with Jeremy Hunt when he was here, there will still be some investment zones, even if they don't call it that, smaller number, and we will be invited to reapply when they have confirmed the criteria. And I think at least one, possibly two of our sites, because it's going to be very much around knowledge intensive industries, will be appropriate. And what we've also said to Michael Gove in our Trailblazer devolution deal is the areas that don't qualify under those new criteria, we still want to bring them forward as what we would call a levelling up zone yeah. in the Trailblazer, even if it's not technically an investment zone. Yeah. So, it's a shame Councillor Rainbow wasn't here for that, but that's the situation. Can I, can I just add one thing, which was there was a tremendous amount of work done by local authority partners, and the result of that is also now a very comprehensive GIS based database of every opportunity site in the West Midlands. And as we go forward, and bringing investment prospectuses together or as you as local authorities take those opportunities to the market um, all of the information that was brought together for investment zones will be incredibly helpful uh, for the region so again it, it was incredibly tight time a huge amount of effort from everybody but it, it is incredibly valuable to have all that information um, for any opportunities that come our way so from the work that was done on the um, various zones that were put forward and you, that you said, Andy, then that you think um, two will be um, pushed forward under the new guise of whatever it might be called. I hope so, but we haven't seen the criteria yet. Right. So will you be looking then to exploit the trailblazer devolution deal options? With those, I mean, and I'm thinking specifically from my own um, borough of Dudley, because it, the, the metro funding and the issues we've had with the extension, were we were looking for some resolution from that by an investment zone, and that felt like it was yet another door closing to us. Yeah, yeah, totally fair. The answer is yes. Um, again, no point in me being um, over optimistic. I think it is unlikely that the Dudley proposed zone will satisfy the new criteria, but we haven't seen them yet. So the conversation I've had with the Central State goes, therefore we will bring Dudley forward as a levelling up zone. Thank you. Do you have any other questions from anybody on, um, Jeremy, did you want to come in on that? Um, it, it's linked to that, I kind of, I have another question I kind of really wanted to ask that you indicated you were expecting anyway in an earlier question, which is about um, ensuring that we get equal funding to different bits of the combined authority. Yeah. You yes. mentioned that Walsall gets the lowest. Yes. My uh, city of Birmingham is the second lowest per head. Okay. So what kind of, what work are you guys doing to make sure we get level funding across the region? Right. You've all got a graph that looks like this. 
uh, and if you sit in uh, uh, Sandwell, uh, you are top of the pops. So uh, a black country borough is top of the pops. Uh, so, so I am very, very conscious of uh, the uh, Warsaw uh, stat on here. But the way we have to do this, we can't just suddenly decide we're making an allocation to Warsaw to level it all up. We have to work with the individual authorities for them then to bring forward their proposals. And so the conversation is very, very live with the Warsaw leadership on what things could come forward. Some of the very big things we funded um, in Solihull, all the stuff around HS2, in Coventry, a lot of stuff came off the back of the City of Culture. In Birmingham, a lot of stuff came off the Commonwealth Games. And I know the per head population of the number in Birmingham isn't out of line, but Warsaw haven't had that opportunity. So we have to work harder, particularly on the Brownfield regeneration piece, which comes back to Amanda's question, uh, just because that one fund is closed, there isn't more. So we are actively trying to work with Warsaw to balance that up. I think this is an important point and it often comes up with regards to the investment program and the utilization of some of the funds that we have we do it is really a we, we someone has to bring forward something as a sponsoring body we will consider that in line with the single assurance framework and if it meets our criteria then basically we, we will invest in it it's very rare i think from my experience as being chair we have ever said no we may have said there are conditions to be applied but Never said no. But we really, really, did, we didn't need the pipeline of those things to come forward for us to be able to assess them from the perspective of the utilisation. The investment programme itself actually can't take much more at the moment. But the other four funds that we actually manage the housing fund, Brownfield Land Property Development Fund, Collective Investment Fund, Revolving Investment Fund, you know, there's still some space within those for people to bring things forward for the investment board to consider but it is a requirement that they are sponsored in most circumstances in fact if all i think by a, the relative local authority it believes it's right that they come to us and the brownfield land fund particularly relevant to the black country areas where we all know the state of the ground is not always great that we can help them support that because the private developers don't do so so the message is bring them forward and we will obviously assess them based on the criteria but you know nine times out of ten I think it would be pretty clear we we tend to support very quickly because we're nearly at the end of yeah, the it, it follows on from my early an early question I was going to that's an interesting uh, aspect of what you just spoke of um, in that um the way uh resources are allocated and in the past we've discussed the speed at which um uh, at, I always look at Andy as uh, saying he's got a, a delegated budget and he dispenses this delegated budget um, as and how it benefits the, the, the region. And uh, from, where am I? Yes. Uh, do you think towards the end of the financial year that our authorities should bring forward shovel ready schemes so that when the next year kicks off everything's ready to go and when the money the money starts to come through we could sort of preload the system at the end of the financial year for the next financial year am i making sense you are you are let me let me try to explain from you here it's entirely it sounds entirely reasonable but there are two types of budget the revenue and the capital and the truth is on the revenue budget uh, which supports all the educate as education for example in dudley or whatever or the transport subsidy we pretty much well we do we spend it all in year we're not sitting on big underspends and i think actually the teams here work pretty effectively uh, without it probably ever being elevated to me on making sure that all that goes out. So I think at a low level that probably happens, but we're not sitting here reporting that we've underspent our education budget or we've suddenly got a nice piece of transport revenue. Mm -hmm. The capital budget, we do, and you and I have had this conversation before, there are some things 
that are inked in and take many, many years to then spend. And I do understand that that can look a bit perplexing. The conversation that keeps being had with leaders is, are we going to stick with that, even if it's many years ahead? And we have every time we've looked at the investment programme, and the Coventry City Centre South one is the best example of this, to call it out. It's six years since that money was allocated. Every time we've looked at it, we say we're going to stick with it. And the really good news is diggers will go in the ground this year. And my personal view is the right decision has been made to stick with it through all that, because it will be transformational. And on the capital projects, that isn't an end of year must be spent by then. So the capital programmes, as we've just been talking with Warsaw, can come through at any time it's rolling. If it was a revenue problem, your question would be spot on, but we're not failing to spend our revenue in year. So I would say bring forward the capital programmes whenever, don't worry, or the capital proposals whenever, don't worry about the annual budgeting on that. I'll, I'll just leave with the aspect was that we should start to see the benefit within that year of the allocation. That was that was a yeah. speaking of the allocation. That was the that's where I was coming from. And I think on revenue we do. Yeah. Uh, and again, that's about visibility of outputs. But on capital, and it's a very fair it's a very fair question for the board to ask: Are we right to take such a long term view and stick with some of these things? But I can promise you, we've asked that of the leaders a number of times, and the decision has always been: Yeah, what we're trying to do here is supposed to be long term transformation, and we stick with it. OK, well, thanks, everybody. That concludes the two hours this morning. I don't know whether you've got any final closing no, comments. No, I just always think, my God, I'm exhausted. <laughs> I'm tired and... I mean, honestly, I always say this at the end of these things. Um, I think they're good exchanges. But I hope, hopefully, it's been worthwhile and everybody's learned a lot. And I've listened carefully to where the interest is. And what I've taken away is outputs. So, yeah. It's always a very good exchange. So thank you all very much. And I'm sorry if I've been a little robust with some, but um, we might as well be honest and straightforward about it. No, thank you very much. And I think, um, you know, we, we appreciate that as equally. You appreciate our um, lines of questioning and the honesty with those questions as well. Absolutely. So uh, thanks very much indeed. If I can ask members of the committee just to remain, please, because we just have um, some final 